But good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Karen Henson. I'm going to use this Tableau resume to um, walk through and quickly introduce myself since it, not everyone on the call knows me. Um, I am speaking to you guys today from Atlanta, and but I'm originally from South Carolina and grew up um, in Aiken, South Carolina, which is just outside of Augusta, and went to school, college in Columbia. I'm a Gamecock, and my husband and I both went to USC. Um, I studied finance, and then after school, I went to work for BB&T, which is now Truist Bank. I did the BB&T Management Development Program um, and worked at BB&T for several years. Took a break to go back to grad school during the recession. Um, I started working with data in 2010 and have been at Chick-fil-A um, for the last eight years. I work at the corporate headquarters um, in a financial services, our financial services department in a group that does analytics and automation um, and just some personal stuff too, some pictures. Um, I've been married for 16 years and my husband and I have four children under 10. Um, we have two sons, two daughters, our oldest, Sophia, is nine and we've got Charlie, he's seven. Meredith and this little baby is Jacob. Um, he's actually not a baby anymore. He looks really, really young here, but this dashboard is a little bit old. So, okay, now that I've told you guys all about me, I'm gonna switch gears and pull this up. Can one of y'all let me know, make sure y'all can see this, right? Yes. Yeah? I'm just gonna assume. Okay, all right, good, perfect. Okay, um, let me see if I can make this bigger dashboard someone remind me how do i get it there's to... that little the little full screen icon beside the share icon up in the top bar um oh, oh Jesse this says, one. Yeah. No, no, no no don't worry about it no. it's all good <laughs> we're just gonna go with it okay <laughs> so all right um i'm a big fan of the nailed it show and since um, Nailed It is all about like featuring just these regular people that are trying to recreate recipes. It made me think of a Nailed It moment that I, I've been through that I figured everyone can probably relate to. So how many of y'all have ever been asked to recreate an existing report in Tableau? Has that ever happened? I'm guessing there would be people if we were all in person, like raising their hands, because I feel like that's pretty common. It's something we all have had to deal with. So I'm going to just show you guys an example uh, from experience and just highlight kind of what I've learned. Um, so let me explain what you're looking at on this page. Um, for many years at Chick-fil-A, before we started using Tableau, analysts produced this Microsoft Access database every single month. Um, for the purposes of this presentation, everything I'm gonna share is like blurred out or the data is all jumbled up or a little bit of both. So I apologize about that. But you can kind of see what you're looking at here. This database provided key metrics on our restaurants and it would come out every month and it would be available to the, all the staff. Um, it took a while to create this every single month um, the data could be shown for every single restaurant, but you could also roll it up. See how it says like level up, level down. Um, so you could create summaries and aggregate the information and look at all the malls or all the freestanders, um, all the drive through restaurants, whatever. Um, one of, but you can also see too, I should point out from, here's an image from 1999 and then over here, 2011, um, it didn't really change a whole lot in all that time. It still looked basically the same. Um, by 2011, there's a lot more of those little tabs. You can see we added a lot of metrics, but otherwise it, it really didn't change a whole lot. One of my first big Tableau projects at Chick-fil-A was to recreate this as a dashboard. And so, this is what I built. Nailed it. 
um, what do you guys think? Um, it's basically the exact same dashboard. I mean, it's the same thing. Like really, look, you can even look at the colors and I don't know if you guys can see the rows themselves are the same color. So in, in addition, it, it really, it's a cross tab. It's, it just looks like an Excel spreadsheet, right? Um, so it's definitely not um, the coolest thing I think I've ever built. Um, it did represent a big improvement in terms of automation and it solved the problem of someone having to rebuild that access database and maintain that thing every month. But I think the big failure here is not taking the opportunity to rethink how best to visualize this data and how to make the insights like really stand out. So a lot of times when I'm asked to do something like this, and I get really specific instructions about how a dashboard should look. I will do it. I will build the view I was asked for, but in addition, build another view in the same workbook. Um, and then just watch the metrics on Tableau server and kind of see what people prefer and how they like to visualize the data. Um, so I'm gonna show you guys, this is another page in that same workbook. And so that's kind of what I did here. This was an attempt to, using the same data, um, look at it slightly different. And I think it's a bit of an improvement. Um, this particular view did wind up being pretty popular on our server. And a lot of folks seem to like having a summary like this and the ability to compare regions like very easily. What you see across the top is data for our entire chain. And of course, all this is fake data. But you can see over here, sales and metrics related to sales, our transaction counts and check average. And on this side, profit metrics and cost. And then in these maps, you can see those, all these metrics, same type of thing. This one is like the sales and sales related metrics. And you can change um, and select some regions. Same thing for um, the map on the right side. Um, one other addition that I think is pretty cool for this particular view at the bottom, just having some additional context. So I added um, just a look, it's simple, but knowing how many days are in the month is very helpful for us because it gives you just, it, it provides a little bit of color to the numbers that you see up at the top. So it means a little more when you know that we're comparing, you know, July 2016 to July 2015, and oh, there was one less business day in 2016. So that kind of makes any of the sales growth that much more impressive. Um, so I've certainly learned a lot just like over the years, and I've listed a few things that I try to be sure to like ask before I start working on any types of projects up here at the top. And then um, once I do start building something, I really do try to focus on this particular question right here. Um, so one last example of a more recent dashboard that I've created, everything here is obviously once again, more fake data. Um, but I, in, in this one, in, um, in financial services, we're always trying to monitor certain types of um, certain types of met metrics on our financial health, the corporate financial health. So we do that whenever we change or model different assumptions about the future, like for instance, more or less stores or uh, bigger or smaller investments in marketing or whatever. Um, we come up with various scenarios and it helps to be able to look at different ones and compare them against against whatever and against one another and also different targets like seeing it are these are these different in this different scenario how would that play out over time and would it be above or below um whatever the target might be um so so there's obviously nothing like super special or really out of the ordinary about this particular dashboard, but it does a much better job of making, in my opinion, the, the most important information really jump out 
and stand out like so that the insights kind of do jump off the page almost immediately. Um, so I think that's about it that I have for today. And I don't know if we have time for questions now, but if we do, I'd be happy to answer any. Karen. If not, no problem too. As always, you've done a lovely job. Um, thank you so much. All you do uh, was like your first iteration was not too dissimilar from kind of where they started. And like, I, I think I've, in the past, I've used the terminology that like a heat map is the gateway drug to visualization. And so <laughs> yeah. it was interesting to see you kind of highlight uh, like kind of use of color in some of your stuff as being like, okay, these are the beginnings of like how I'm going to kind of bring you along. And then I love the maps and stuff like that. So super cool. And then yeah. you know, somebody pointed out, you know, they, there's definitely branding in there. Um, there was a question just now that can go yeah. back to the screen that has the checklist. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Okay, hang on a second. Yes. <clears throat> Yeah, so really, like, to me, this last thing I feel like is sort of the most important thing that I try to do these days. I really think what makes, like, an analyst, what sets someone apart as an analyst is really just someone taking the time to answer these questions over here and, like, really understand the data and, like, what are the nuances in the data? How will this really be used and how can the data influence decisions? Um, but then at the bottom, in terms of like creating a dashboard that's like really effective, I think, especially for, for folks that have a limited amount of time, just an understanding like from our point of view as an analyst, knowing that like someone may not spend even five minutes on this. They may only have like one or two minutes. What can you do immediately that just makes the data jump off the page and like, what they need to know is just right there in front of their face. And it's obvious. I love that. And that's part of what visualization is, is like, how do I draw your eye to the issue, frankly, and help you make the next right decision? Um, that's awesome. There was one yeah. other question that popped up um, talking about the data source. You mentioned like the original version of this was coming off of access. Um, somebody was hoping on your behalf that the access database has been sunset and that you have moved on to bigger and better things. <laughs> That's so true. Yes. Yeah. Like actually all of those views and this old fake workbook is all from a Tableau, um, an old Tableau conference presentation back in like 2016. We created these for, for an old presentation. But, um, but yeah, this is no longer, we're no longer using this. And then even even these views have still changed like a little bit over time because they're they're old now. Um, but this is what we started with, and it's interesting sometimes to just like go back and relook at these things because inevitably when you look at something and it's been several years and you've learned a lot, like having you know done this type of work over all those years, you realize like oh if I could go back and do it again, I certainly would have done X Y Z different, you know. Um, you learn a lot over time. <laughs> I think that was you and the famous Mark Hunt, if I remember, in 2016. It was. Yes, it was. Yeah, I was. I think I was on the first or second row for that one. So, awesome. <laughs> Any other questions before we let Karen run to the babies? Sorry, I hate to do that, guys. <laughs> Don't you apologize. I will be listening in. I just will turn this video off. <laughs> awesome. Karen, do you want All to right. hand the baton? Who's next? Oh, your man. I'll take, I'll take the A literal proverbial first. baton. <laughs> awesome. No, so you can't Perfect. take it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm getting out of here. You, you guys go. All thank right. You, Karen. Thank you, Karen. Thanks, Nelson. Thanks, uh, all the, the folks in... Atlanta for for having me hosting this this combined uh, Tableau user group with uh, us in Raleigh Raleigh Durham as well as Christian in Tucson and all the folks in in Arizona. Uh, so we we've been talking 
and planning this for for a while and it's it's just such an honor that we get to we get to do this because we don't have to we don't have to fly anywhere we don't have to drive anywhere so we're just taking taking advantage of of being virtual um so yeah so i i am my name is christopher scott i co-lead the raleigh durham let me try to move out of i can't move out of the way enough <laughs> the raleigh durham table user group uh with five five of my my friends my data fam we'll get we'll get to them in a minute um but let me share my screen so you're not just looking at me um you are actually looking at content all right so the uh so again you know the the theme of today is is nailed it and and things that uh you know ways in which in which we have failed to show that we're we're human and and that even even the best of us those of them that have been working in tableau i've been working in tableau for uh a little over nine years now since 2012. um i made a lot of mistakes along the way uh but as as i kind of thought about this uh, i i couldn't really find uh, a lot of examples, I think, you know, I've done obviously what Karen has done, as you'll see later, what Christian and Anna and Nelson have, have done. I've done all those things. Um, but I thought I thought a little bit, a little bit more about um, not just the, the ways I've failed in Tableau, um, but more so the ways that, that I have um, kind of kind of career, some of the ways that I've I really, really kind of messed up and, and laid a lot of things on um you know took on too much and so we'll we'll talk about that in a second but so mine's not going to be very tablet specific um but it will have hopefully some practical implications no matter what tool you're using what uh what business you're in or what you know position you are in your in your life so hopefully this this has some wide-reaching uh, implications for for all of us all right so um, again, who am I? Christopher Scott, as you will see, like Karen and like Nelson, um, I am a father of four. There you'll see my, my brood. And if you saw earlier today, we decided that four was not enough. We did not love all the punishment that came with, with four kids. So we thought we'd add another to the mix and, and we, we added a puppy. So you saw my puppy earlier. Uh, she is a, a very much a puppy. Um, but yes, yeah, so we, we love our, our big family. We love, um, being here in, in the Raleigh area wouldn't, wouldn't be, be anywhere else. So, um, as, as was mentioned, I am the co-leader of the Raleigh Durham Tableau user group. I am also a user group ambassador. Um, I lead the BI enablement team at Enact Mortgage Insurance in Raleigh, North Carolina, formerly Genworth. Um, so I manage all, all of our Tableau and do all of that fun stuff, um, training and center of excellence, all, all the things that you you all have, are very familiar with. Um, again, as I mentioned, father of four, and I, I love to put this on here. I have very expensive tastes, whether it's coffee, guitars, bourbon, or, or craft beer. Um, and I am the spender and my wife is the saver. So that should let you know everything <laughs> you need to know about, about me. Um, again, I do want to give a shout out and a, and a thank you um, to my tireless team uh, of, of my co-leaders here, um, everybody from, from Paul McHale, Greg Lewandowski, who I'm sure you all recognize, Jesse Bigman is, is actually on the line, um, and then Marit, uh, who, who has just joined our team and will be going off uh, for, for a little while. Because she has just uh, had had a baby, so anyway, we're 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 growing. We're super excited and super happy to be um, part of you know this this community. So, all right. So when we talked about nailed it, um, I I took it extremely literally. I said nailed it, nail. And then last week or two weeks ago, um, somebody accused me of this, and and I said, you know, I resemble that remark. So the phrase is, I'm sure you all have heard this, um, Abraham Maslow said, if, if all you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. Um, so this, this is a very familiar phrase. It's been attributed. A lot of people have, have repeated this. Um, but essentially, it's, it's what's called the, the golden hammer or the, I think it's, um, I was trying to think of, of what, there, I, had it, I have it in my notes somewhere. Um, no, that's not it. Oh, sorry. Um, so there's essentially this this idea that uh, that when you've got this tool, that you love this tool, um, you 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 want to use it for for everything. Whether it's for you know, like uh, I think Karen's uh, example was was one of my first mistakes and and everything. And it's that 
if, if it's a table, if it's any kind of data, it's got to go into Tableau. And what, you know, and this is something I still, I still struggle with and have, am learning to, to grow. And we'll talk about solutions to all this in, in just a moment. But yeah, I mean, so I think, you know, thinking through, thinking through what does it mean to, to be able to, you know, utilize Tableau and utilize Tableau well, and not just go around with, with this hammer that you've got and think that, oh, well, Tableau can ingest data. Maybe we should just use it to ETL everything and it's going to solve all of our problems. And that's, and that's not the, that's not the case. And so, um, you know, there was this quote that I found earlier this week. Um, you know, it's essentially this, uh, this guy, Jose Gilgado said, we tend to use the same known tools to do a completely new, different project with new constraints. So it's our comfort zone state where we, you don't need to change anything uh, you don't change anything to avoid risk. The problem with using the same tools every time is that you don't have enough arguments to make a choice because you have nothing to compare it to and you're limiting your knowledge. So um, so that's that's where I was stuck for, for many years. I, I just, I said, okay, I'm going to be the Tableau guy. That's all I'm going to know. That's all I'm going to stick with. Um, and so, so I, my, my knowledge, my, my experience, my exposure was, was very limited and I became kind of this one trick pony. Um, so he says, Jose comes back and says the solution is to keep looking for the best possible choice, even if we aren't familiar with it. And so over the past few years, I mean, just opening myself up to new technologies, to learning, learning new, you know, ETL tools, right? Learning Alteryx, learning, uh, learning Tableau Prep now, which we have, we've got over the past few months, we have created 40 new flows at our company um, just from turning on Tableau Prep because it was that in demand that we, we just, we, people couldn't get enough of it. So opening myself up, um, you know, to that, that possibility. Uh, and then actually something that Nelson said, uh, I think five years ago. So we were 2016. The first time I met Nelson, um, we were we were talking, and you said <laughs> yes. Um, so Nelson said something that will never never uh, leave my my mind, and this has kind of been one of the establishing philosophies. It's that where would you want to spend the majority of your time? Do you want to spend it? You know, yes, I can do this thing in in SQL, or I can create it in Tableau, or am I going to use a new tool that can help me to do like something like Alteryx that can help me to do that, you know, save myself time, save you time, and then ultimately, you know, get, get the same results. But now I can make those decisions so much faster. So Nelson, thank you. That's Writing been that really, that, <laughs> it's been a dri like a driving philosophy that has helped me to, again, grow beyond just thinking that everything needed to be in, you know, in Tableau. So Anyway, I, I say all that, that, um, that, you know, we, we talk about this whole idea of your toolbox, understanding that Tableau is merely a tool in your toolbox and a really proficient. And I think, you know, this is something that, uh, that Karen said, and we, we talked about before was that being a proficient analyst and, and understanding being a good data analyst is about knowing, knowing which tool to use when, like, like a good carpenter, like a good, um, you know, handyman. They're not going to go around looking for, um, you know, screwing in a screw with with a hammer. So, uh, all right. So that's that's solution number one. Now, problem number two, and this is something that I struggle with even even today, um, is this superhero syndrome. Um, so, what is it? I, I'm sure you've all have heard heard of this before. It's it's very very familiar. Um, I think we all we all have have a little bit of this um, characteristic in us. Um, but basically, the definition is a person seeking heroism or recognition, usually by creating a harmful situation to objects or person in which they can resolve. And I'll add, I'll add a little, you know, that little blurb that I'll add my own, uh, you know, definition there, which only they can resolve or only they can solve. And so I find I find myself doing this quite often and becoming, you know, is that that very familiar phrase that we're all familiar with kind of this single point of failure where you are creating these, these massive, uh, you know, data sets and dashboards, where if that thing fails, everything's everything's going to go to pot, and you are the only one that can fix it. Um, so again, this kind of the, the detriment of this is that one member of the team assumes responsibility for doing everything. Not only this, but in spite of taking on extra work and responsibilities, they take any failures and mistakes to heart, always striving for, for perfection. I call myself a, 
a very lazy type A, a lazy perfectionist, because I love to see everything perfect, but I'm, I'm usually not the one to, to, to always try and go, go after it. But, you know, when I, when I do these things and something fails or I'm not able to, to accomplish, you know, the goal or, or something doesn't get done on time, I mean, all of these things, it's, it's because I brought it, I brought it on myself. And so, you know, what this can do is this can create a huge amount of, of burnout. And so I've seen this both in, you know, in myself and my personal life. I've also seen this in, in others that, um, that they just, they create these things. They want to do, they want to strive for perfection and create all of these amazing things, but they're, they're taking, they're taking others out of the equation. And so, you know, I immediately, thought of all of the, and so I'm, I'm searching on, on Google and all of these things just hit me like a ton of bricks. And so, you know, whether it's your ego, hubris is the opposite of trust. It's only hubris if I fail, said, said Julius Caesar. And then finally, you know, all of these words that we are extremely familiar with, hotshot, hubris, vain, conceited, cocky, and I, I haven't even read all the all the other <laughs> the other ones, um, but I see ego in there. And all of these, all of these facets um, just lead to, I mean, again, doing it, our, doing it ourselves, this superhero syndrome where I, I have got to be the best thing out there because my job's writing in it, or I'm not going to get, you know, this promotion, or I'm not going to get this job, or I'm not going to be, you know, this or that. And so, so I, I've just, you know, personally just struggled thinking that I had to do it all, all on my, all on my own. And so, you know, I, I was again reading reading some articles about this, and so one of the one of the articles that I read, and I'll, I've got a list at the end that when I share this deck, um, it's all of the articles that I read and reference are in the sources list. So one of the articles said, "Make a list," and I thought this was really cool because if I think about the the practical and and kind of intangible things, the way that I would represent this, these are things that I I do and that I shouldn't do, but um, think about the things that you hate to do or the things that you can't do, right? I mentioned, you know, using Tableau as an ETL tool. That's, that's probably because I couldn't do, I couldn't write a SQL statement to save my life. And so I was just using Tableau to bring in all the data, assuming I knew how these, these things worked. Um, and then same thing that, that is in the same bucket. Like what are the things that you shouldn't be doing? What are those opportunities where you're, you are, you're sticking your finger in your, your, grabbing that Excel sheet or that act that access database and you're throwing it in the tableau just because you see data and you think it's going to it's going to make you you know look better well now you have to support that now you have to do these things and so now it's this vicious cycle so finally you know all of this makes way to doing what you love to do to doing what you can do the things that you're skilled at the things that you're you are passionate about and ultimately the things that you should be doing you have you know wherever you're at you've got a job description and so if you you look at the parameters and the boundaries of that job description chances are you know some of those things that you've that you have created that you're supporting are not the things that you should be doing they are not top priority so you know all of these things really help us to prioritize and again the other solution besides all of those making those lists is ultimately it's it's to delegate and so it's you know it isn't always easy but you know and this is one of the the quotes that i read but you have a much easier time if you can get uh i'm, I'm sorry yeah so <laughs> uh so one of these ways is that we can we can say we can say no so again spreading spreading the workload so it's not always easy but if you can get used to asserting yourself start with the small requests and it helps to be able to be ready to put your foot down and reject anything. And then that way, again, so you're not overworking yourself, that you are, people are getting used to, to hearing you not just say, say yes to everything. And then you're not, you're not going to get burned out because you're, you're overwhelmed, overworked, and, and you just don't have time for those important things. Again, the things you should be doing. Maybe it's, maybe it, it actually extends to your personal life, right? Maybe if you're, you've got this superhuman, superhero complex, and then maybe you are you are ultimately you know working 60 70 80 hours a week and that's taking away from from the things in your life your family your friends i mean your community you know all of those those assets that should be priorities in our life when we think about those things so um so again you know th these are not 
the superhero syndrome being a superhero in in this day and age it's it should not be looked at as a as a prize or as a you know a badge to be worn um but when we start to see these things it should be it should be a red flag in our minds so again obviously delegate and this is a, i love this quote by ronald reagan i found it this week as i was doing some more research surround yourself with the best people you can find delegate authority and don't interfere so long as the policy you've decided upon is being carried out. Now, I know, and I, Nelson, I'll give you time to talk about this after the presentation, but, you know, thinking about your, your, new, your new company, and I'm sure I've, I've seen the people you've hired, you know, you're surrounding yourself with, with great people. Um, so I, I do want to hear about that after, after this last point. So give me one, one more second. All right. Um, so the last- I love this, by the way. I'm like, I'm soaking right now. This is awful. <laughs> So the last thing is, um, and I've, I've done a presentation on this, and, I, and the, you see the little link is down there at the bottom. Um, but ultimately, when you think about delegation, you think about trust, you think about surrounding yourself with, with smart people, um, you know, you have an opportunity. Sometimes you're going to have to carry those things. Sometimes you are the only one that can do those things. Um, but if you continue to, to be the only person that can do those things, you're going to stay in this Sherpa mindset that you're going to have to help carry the people up the mountain. Only you can do it. Well, you know, th there's a statistic out there that more Sherpas die every year in the Himalaya than tourists or anyone else because they're overexerted. Yes, they do know the terrain and everything else better than anyone else, but they're the ones that are continuously getting burnt out, tired out. They're, they're making, you know, really dumb mistakes because they're just tired. And so, so, you know, if, if that's all we do, if all we're doing is sherping, we're going to, I don't know if that's a word, sherpaing, um, but all we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to burn out. We're going to, we're going to ultimately create this, these more points of failure for us as individuals and ultimately for our teams, our organizations and everyone around us. So it's just this kind of ripple effect. Um, so, but if we take this shepherd mindset where we are instilling trust in people, you know, I, I mean, obviously, you know, sheep, sheep are pretty dumb, but you know, the people we work with aren't. So we, we have to realize that we can, we can take that knowledge that we've learned. We can do knowledge transfer. We can train, we can, you know, we can do these things. And these are the things that are going back to that point before the things that we can and should do are things like instilling more trust, delegating, training, helping, helping others to, to come behind us and, and learn from us, learn what we're doing. So that way we're, we're kind of instilling, again, this getting away from this idea of a single point of failure. Um, so again, I, I have done the full presentation on the difference between when to shepherd and when to Sherpa. Um, so that link is there. All of my links are here in the sources. So with, if that's it, uh, that's it from me. Um, so I will stop sharing and yeah. So Nelson, I mean, I think we got some, uh, thank you, Christian. Good to know that <laughs> chirping. Um, yeah. So Nelson, any thoughts about how you've, you've surrounded yourself with, with good people? Well, <clears throat> even more than just obviously surround yourself with great people. Like we should do that anyway. Uh, one of yeah. our, our good uh, one of our our great people that's inside of our organization reminds us constantly that it, you know we are kind of the average of the five people we spend the most time with um and so you definitely want to be surrounding yourself with great people you made an amazing point though and i wanted to dig into it with you around the hero um and one of the things that uh you know i'm very big on kind of the you know there's a whole kind of storytelling and story brand type of thing that donald miller does and he talks a lot about you know you can be the hero and there may be a season that all of us, you know, learn a lot as a hero, but in the long term, what we ultimately want to be is we want to be Yoda and not Luke Skywalker, right? <laughs> we want to be the mentor or the sage, uh, which kind of gets to your kind of your last point, which is like, do we Sherpa or do we shepherd? Right. And so <clears throat> it, it'd be really interesting to dig into the talk that you gave on that. But I think the, the conversation is fascinating. Um, and like, honestly, like, you know, this is, you know, not, this goes so far beyond the tableau pieces. Like, this is such a great just presentation. Like, hey, as I look backward on your 30, you know, at the wise old age of 36, um, <clears throat> I say that as a 37 year old, um, that, uh, you know, I've, I've made some very similar um, things that I, I look back and, and I wish I would have, I would have done differently given perspective that I have now. But man, the, the, the opportunity to surround yourself with great people is a second to none opportunity. So 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Kudos to you for calling a lot of these things out. Fantastic. Well, I mean, again, all, all of these things are things I still struggle with. So, I mean, I haven't even, I have not reached. So lest, lest anybody on the, on the call think that I have attained to any of these things. I, I, I have not, I'm still, still pressing on and striving on to, to learn, learn from my mistakes. So, and thanks for, thanks for letting me share and, and yeah, can't wait to hear the rest. When, and I don't know if you want to hop on, but you and I had a conversation not too long ago about this very exact thing, right? That Chris was talking about around like, you know, you were kind of saying, you know, you know how do I keep an an answering all these questions? And, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm spending my nights and weekends doing this. And you were like, you know, how do you, what, what are we supposed to do? And I was like, you're supposed to stop. Like you're, and, and one thing that, look, you oh, no, I was going to say, and this is a great uh, segue because um, I feel like you've been a mentor to me, but you guys were just naming ages and, and I'm 42. I'm older than you guys, but, um, and we have a tendency to tie age to wisdom. And I don't think that's necessarily, I think we should always be seeking. We don't have, we have to, we can't assume we always know. Yeah. And so I, um, Nelson's a person I call, I'm like, let's talk. Like, I, I just, I need to get some things. And so, so that, that was a really good example of the things that we talk about. Well, and, and one thing that I had learned not too much ahead of the conversation that you and I had that, again, speaks to this point, and we'll talk about this and we'll move on. But, you know, when you are doing that and being the hero and consistently doing that and kind of saving people on your team and whatnot, one of the things I shared with you is that I have now come to realize I'm stealing the opportunity for them to go through the hard work that it takes to really learn this stuff, right? You know, if I keep absorbing it and kind of saying, I know how to do this, I know how to solve the hard problem, it it steals the opportunity from the people that you're trying to grow and lead and allowing them to feel the pressure because they you, you know you're the you're the safety release valve. And they don't ever have to feel the pressure, right? And so I, you know, I I, I learned it and sometimes when I tell somebody else what to do, it's like I'm I'm also talking to the person in the mirror. So Anyway. Well, that's a good, another good segue to what you're going to show, because this is one thing that you were kind about when we were demoing this is the fact that you and I actually started working on this next one together. Yes, we did. So I'm going to step back and let you demo. All right, here we go. So uh, as has been previously mentioned already, um, my name is Nelson Davis, put y'all over here. Um, I also have four kids. I think as uh, I shared, I, I believe that that's probably the uh, the right number of children in order to be a tug leader. Um, but that's just an opinion. You could take that with a grain of salt. But um, this, is, this is my crew. Um, we have all boys, by the way. So um, they're a rambunctious bunch here at the Davis family. We also have the dog who listens uh, to nobody in particular. Um, and so anyway, um, love the opportunity to, to show the family every once in a while. So here we go. So uh, today what we're going to do is I'm going to teach you about an opportunity that I had around building a racing chart. Now, some of you, as we know, are already here uh, and you're kind of part of the, the Atlanta Tug, a Tug family. Um, and so I would imagine if a handful of you were here when we did a, uh, a racing visualization during our 10 year anniversary. Um, and what you're seeing here is the, I think, um, the number of the, the, the highest number of model cars going back to like 1908. And what's fascinating here is that the Model T was like the number one uh, most built car up until like 1980. And then like in like the mid nineties, it went to number three, but like it was 16 million 500 um, uh, total production. Uh, it still like fascinates me that that's such a, you know, it's still up on the top 10 basically. And, the idea of a racing chart is that you're seeing things switch and that you've got like kind of the leader is always the leader and it's always kind of to the fullest extent and so forth. And so we wanted to do some very creative ways of celebrating our 10 year anniversary. Welcome to the Atlanta Temple User 10 year anniversary. We had, by the way, um, over 300 people join us at Comcast. I saw Andre Merrill. Andre uh, was the man, the myth and the legend that made all that stuff happen along with Jen Lisport. Um, we had, I think, over uh, 420 or 450 people try to sign up and come. Um, and so that was like amazing. Like the whole thing was amazing. I, I should have gone and grabbed one of the pictures. Uh, one of y'all go grab one of the pictures uh, and shoot it over here. But um, it was such a, an amazing time. But uh, we wanted to announce like, you know, place that had posted the most and 
uh, we wanted to do some uh, different shout outs and stuff like that. And um, one of the things that we also wanted to highlight or profile was like all of our presenters, because these things don't happen unless people have things to present. So uh, what I wanted to do was, it was like, I don't know, two or three days before it's like, hey, let's do a racing chart for the presenters. And I'm thinking to myself, like, you know, the, the newest version of Tableau, like 2020.1 had just been released or was in beta and it had animations. And I was like, oh, this is going to be perfect, right? We're going to figure this thing out. And so, of course, um, I don't know if y'all know me, but um, I'm kind of a just-in-time delivery kind of guy. Um, and so this would be, um, I started the project right around this time here, which uh, I've, I've carefully gone back and calculated the, the, the night before. Uh, and and as you can see here, I was making modifications. Uh, given the fact that our our whole thing was going to go live at 1 p.m., I was I was doing some things the morning of. And so as I went back to um, look at what was originally done, I was like, "Huh, that's funny." Um, and so that that initial kind of huh, you know how do I do this thing kind of landed me with this visualization right here. Um, and so what we're going to do is basically kind of show you. Um, you know, it, it took me a little while. Like, I, I, I was like, I feel like I should know how to do this, right? You know, I, I, once upon a time, I was a Zen, and, you know, we're good at figuring things out as a general rule. Uh, and so I'm texting with Anna, and because I think I we had originally kind of said, Anna, maybe maybe you tackle it. She was like, eh, I don't know. And so I was like, well, maybe I'll give it a shot, right? And so I was like, who, who can get there first? Um, and I kind of got stuck because I was like, well, you know, I don't, you know, how do I get things to move and go up and down and da, 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 da. and then ultimately we, we ended up creating something awesome and so if if you in, end up enjoying this um the QR for the workbook for all this is right here so I'll come back to this slide at the end um but I'm gonna shift over to Tableau land um and kind of start with this right <clears throat> so this is basically our little data set that we've got here um and Karen keeps track of all this so this is a, a real data set as it was back at that point in time and what I'm basically doing is I'm looking at the presenters and punchline uh, was part of it was that I had actually done the most, which was kind of funny. Um, and what I was what we we're looking at was the account distinct of topics. Right. So the reason we're doing that is because, you know, you may have um, uh, you may show up multiple times on a particular day or you may end up having like multiple presenters on the same topic. So I wanted to make sure that we were kind of counting things apples to apples as best we could. Um, but the problem was, is that like, I wasn't getting to a place where, you know, I was seeing things move and I just was kind of scratching my head a little bit. And so what we're going to do is basically kind of, you know, this being the starting point of the frustration point of the nailed it point of like, this isn't racing, this isn't working and so forth. Um, you know, one of the things I know about racing is that, you know, I've got to have something on the page itself because that's where the animation begins. Right. And I'm kind of look at this and be like, oh, well, hey, at least now I've got things that are happening, right? And so I'm seeing this, but like, there's nothing additive that's happening. Um, you know, the name, like the the order, of the name isn't moving, right? And those of you who've never used the pages shelf, uh, the pages basically just kind of keeps um, all the different slices of this thing, and and um, it gives you kind of a hey, here's how the thing would move over the course of time. And so um, basically, what this is showing is that like. For example, in December 2019, Nelson, Karen, and Travis Harple presented, right? But really nothing other, I guess there are a bunch of other folks but presented too. So cool. Uh, but nothing more material than that. It's just kind of, and eh, this isn't really the information that I want. So the first thing that I need to be able to do is I need to be able to, as time moves forward, I need to be able to add these things up as we go, right? And the the the, the thing I'll share with you from the outset is that a lot of this is going to be table calcs. And um so we're going to start with that. And so I've created this table calc here called total presentations, and I'm going to use a running sum. And the reason I'm going to use a running sum is because as the number of months increases in the, into the future, I want to basically kind of run the sum, right? So this is basically kind of over the course of time, I'm going to add these things up. And the thing that I'm going to add up is that count distinctive topic, right? So first thing I'm going to do is just going to bring this right up to here, right? And so now I've got um, Andy Piper, Paul Lisborg, but if I bring this forward, right, what we hope to happen is that, oh, it's still not working, crud. All right, so let's see what's going on, right? So what we want to be able to do is we need to, oh, it's not summing on the right thing, right? So if we think about, well, what are we going to add up over the course of time? It's not what's on our rows, right? That's just presenters, and that's not really going to help us at all. What we actually want to sum up is the date, right? That month Thing. And now all of a sudden we have something that actually looks like, all, you know, kind of like it's helpful almost, right? 
And so we can kind of look and begin to go backwards and you can see there's a little bit of animation stuff. And this is kind of cool because, you know, it's, it's fun. The problem is, is that, you know, in the beginning, Paul and Andy are like the winners. Um, and, you know, the racing chart, if you can remember, it should be such that like kind of whoever's leading should be leading, right? And so that's kind of an issue that we, we haven't really solved for. And so kind of big thing, like, you know, the, the big kind of paradigm shift as you think about building a, a, a racing chart uh, and the punchline that I'll tell you is that the presenter or the thing that is racing should not be in rows. Uh, that's, that's the big kind of thing. It needs to be on a level of detail. And I will go ahead and tell you that we're going to put it on presenter or sorry, uh, put, uh, put presenter onto label. Okay. And so now what we end up with is something that again is, is a little bit funky, but uh, it's heading in the right direction here. So I'll, I'll tell you that. The other thing that we need is we need to be able to have kind of a, a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, right? And whatever. So uh, what we want to be able to do in this case now is we want to be able to rank uh, the total number of presentations by each one of the presenters. Okay. So I've got a little formula over here that I wrote earlier as well. So this is uh, rank unique. So as I just mentioned to you a second ago, total presentations. So this thing right here. And what we're going to do is we're going to do that in a descending fashion, right? So we basically want to have the, whoever has the most presentations should be number one. And then number, you know, the second most, number two, third most, number three. We're using rank unique because we want uh, to be kind of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, even if they have the same number, right? So this is not a golf rank and it's not just a normal rank where you would kind of have everybody. Um, this is a, a straight, it's like a force rank. Right, so, so there's that. So we're gonna take rank, and we're gonna put up here, right here, right? And so everything's perfect. Oh no, it's not, right? And this is where the fun really begins, okay? And as I went back My to this, apologies. nope. As I went back, uh, I began to realize just uh, what kind of shenanigans it took in order to figure this thing out. So the rank that we need to do, y'all, uh, we wanna rank our what? We wanna rank our presenters, right? So we're just gonna hit that and that's gonna solve everything. No, it's not. <clears throat> and here's where it gets really, really funky. Okay, so and if you haven't dealt with this concept before, let me blow your mind for a quick second, because Tableau has something what, called a, a nested table calculation. And we're not going to go super far into this, but we are going to get a little bit funky with it, right? And so what I've basically done here is rank is the thing that's happening, but then inside of rank is the total presentations, right? And if y'all remember, a second ago, we needed total presentations to compute not on presenter, but on month of date, right? And so the and when we open this thing up and we have this kind of table calc dialogue, if you ever see this dialogue, I'm going to X out of it for a second, as opposed to this dialogue where there is no option, that means there is an opportunity to do a nested table calculation. And what this means is it's kind of like inception where you kind of go like multiple layers into a thing. And so what I'm also going to do is go into total presentations. And because I clicked presenter on rank, it assumed on my behalf, and we all know what assuming does, it assumed on my behalf that I wanted all of the layers of this table calculation to be done in the same way. As we've mentioned already, we don't. We want um, the total presentations to be done on the month of the date. And we want to restart every presenter and all of a sudden, winner, winner, chicken dinner, we now have, look at that, both Andy and Paul, right? And we're even starting to get a little bit of the kind of the, the action that we're after, right? You guys can begin to see, hey, it's doing what we want it to do. It's ranking on the total number of presentations by the presenter. And so in this case, as we kind of go forward, we've got like all this stuff going on here, right? So this is, the action is, is now happening that we want, right? So this is pretty cool. Now, a couple other pieces that kind of get us to like the end game, right? So uh, I kind of decided, you know, hey, I don't really want all of uh, the rank. I really just want to have like 10 spots. And so um, I'm going to hit the simple button and I'm going to uh, take rank and uh, put it on the shelf and then turn it continuous and just do the top 10. That gets rid of everything uh, 11 and below, but it also gets rid of my null, which is annoying uh, and I don't want it to be there either. So now I've just got the 10. So I'm going to spread that out. So do my fit height. Right there, and so again, we're starting to get there, starting to get there, starting to get there, right? So you can kind of, again, let me just hit play for a hot second, so you can kind of see some of the little things happen. Boom, there you go, right? So that's pretty cool. Um, and then the last piece, and again, you know, I'm just going back to kind of what we saw a minute ago with the the best practice that you you saw in the little YouTube video, is 
you're seeing kind of a raw number instead of the you know the the number is kind of increasing and and you're kind of starting with like well what here's the full extent what we really want is like we want it more as like hey the leader is kind of leading and it's always the full extent and everybody else is trying to catch up so the last piece of this is basically just take this total presentations thing that you got here and then divide that by the window max and the window is this thing uh so this is the window at any given time and again we're doing all of this on a um, table count type of thing, right? So there's window maps, and then I'm just going to take the total presentations for it, just like that. See if this works. If it doesn't, I've got a nice little fix. Now we're getting close, right? We still have to go back and tell it, you know, how to do all the different things and so forth, right? So there's that. And then uh, this is another uh, nested table count for us. So total presentations, it knows how to do that the right way. But total presentations be divided by the window max. Again, that goes back to the presenter, right? And so that, again, is another nested table count. And so now all of a sudden, where it was the full number, now you see it as a basically like a percent, right? We could make it a percent, but we're not going to. And so the effect, if it all worked, is that we begin to get the action the way we want it to, right? So now we have kind of that full extent type of thing happening. Boom, bada bing. Or this is awesome. We added some funky, fun stuff in here. We made the colors do different things. We added another version here. Actually, I'll just show you that one real quick too, because uh, some of you may be wondering, well, how'd you do that piece, right? So if we do a, a control, click and drag, now we got two axes. We'll do a dual axis on this. One of those we want to stay as the Gantz or the bar. Was it a bar? Let's assume it was a bar. There's the bar. The other one we're going to do as a uh, little circly thing. Uh, we're going to align these two uh, axes. So there's that. And then this uh, little circly thing is going to go to white and get big, right? And then instead of presenter, it'll just be the rank. Boom. Actually, no, it wasn't rank. It was total presentation. That's what it was. Sorry. I lied. Apologies. There's that. Boom, bada bing. And then. Um, this is going to go to a label that's somewhere over there. Pretend like I did it already, all right? So there's all that. Boom, bada bang. And then um, this is kind of our what it ultimately looks like, right? So take it back to the beginning, and then hit play, and then let it run for a minute. So there we go. Uh, nested table calcs nailed it in I don't know what ten minutes, hopefully something like that. I don't know. Um, not nearly as good as Christopher's presentation, no doubt, but uh, or Karen's, but um, if there's questions, I'd love to answer them. So hopefully this was helpful, interesting, informative. I don't know. Nested table caps is like, that's an advanced concept that I've, I've, I've hesitated to even try to bring up. So that was amazing. And I think a lot of the questions were answered in chat, but if there's any more, you can put that in Q&A or chat. Actually, Q&A might be easier for Nelson to answer. And nope. next up, we have the Christian Felix. What? The Hello. The Thank you for passing the baton, Anna. Let me go ahead and Nelson. Oh, wait, no, Nelson, you have to pass it. Oh, Nelson. Yes, I have, I have stopped. I'm coaching. <laughs> and I'm out. All right, let me share my screen. Okay, thumbs up that my screen is indeed being shared, or just a confirmation. Yeah, we yeah. can see it. Okay, before I dive into that, I think I'll follow suit and share a picture. I tend to, we tend to travel with a lot of kids. We have four, um, so there's a thing there, like uh, Nelson and Chris were saying. And we recently visited Atlanta. So this picture was taken this uh, summer in July. We visited some friends who moved from Tucson to Atlanta. Not Atlanta. This is, I believe, in Gainesville, Murrayville area. And so four of these are mine, my son, my three daughters, and this is a family friend, and this, these are their kids. Anyway, did a long road trip. Um, and so there's, there's a bit of a kindred uh, spirit with, with our Atlanta friends here because of the road trip. So... Um, so yeah, that's the picture. That's the family. Um, back to Tableau online. So what I wanted to do, um, and first, what, what I want to do first is give a shameless plug for the developer program, because as part of the developer program, you get a instance of Tableau online to test 
new features or um, other things you're looking to test prior to bring them into production in your own environment. So that's what you're looking at here. So this is my Tableau Online instance. Um, in it, I can test some of the new features like collections, personal spaces, metrics, um, or I can just use it for uh, version sharing and iteration with other collaborators, which is what I'm going to show here. Um, and so let me navigate to the projects. And so what I used this for last year was a collaborative space with my sous visitor, uh, Sasha Singh. And so what you're going to be seeing here is you're, you're basically getting an inside look into the week uh, leading up to IronViz last year. And the good thing about version control um, is that you can go back and retrospectively look at all of the ugliness and all of the, the, the bad failures, things that led up to the final product. Um, and not necessarily bad, they're just, it's just part of the process. And so that's what we're going to do here. So I'm going to walk you guys through um, each of the days leading up to the final build date, which was the 21st of September. And in those different versions, just walk you through some of the things that needed to be changed that should not, should not have made it into and didn't make it into the final production uh, build that was shown during the competition. Um, and in doing so, you're going to get a firsthand look at how the sausage was made, um, so to speak. So this is not something you do if you're trying to maintain some illusion of, of perfectionism, but if I'm honest, this is the process I think all of us go through when we're trying to develop an information resource, and I'm no different. So let me just uh, step in here. Oh, and also it's a, it's a plug for IronViz because it's coming up again, right? So we have, we have a couple more months before the 2021 version at TC-ish. So we have uh, the Monday before, so this is September 14th. The final build was filmed on the 21st. And I believe the conference last year was October, the first week of October or so. Um, so looking at the very first version, again, bear with me, this is, um, this is very much in development, but I think it helps convey some best practices, some things that I learned al along the way in the development process, um, and some things that needed to be improved. Uh, so, so the first takeaway here in terms of a, a failure is really when you're trying to introduce interactivity, best practice is always to ensure that whatever, um, whatever means you're using to introduce that um, also uh, changes, whatever it changes is on the same screen. So a user clicks a parameter or clicks a filter and they don't have to scroll down to view what changed or view the impact of that interaction. And so what you're seeing here is the top half of the dashboard that when a filter was applied here or here, a user would then have to go down and scroll to see if anything changed and, and what changed. Uh, another thing, if there are any IronViz contestants on this call is don't try and use data tables in IronViz. Um, probably not a, a good idea. I don't know why I started going down that road, but hey, that's the iterative process, right? Um, the other thing you'll see here, and it's gonna be a common theme throughout the iterations is I'm trying to scope my story. So you have all these variables, things that are very interesting uh, in terms of predicting um, the PM25 air pollution, travel time in different cities, congestion levels, uh, CO2 emissions. But although they're interesting, perhaps not uh, primary to the main driver or to the, the fundamental analysis. So again, we'll see that more and more as I go through some of these versions. Okay, so that was September 14th. September 15th. And this is the first time I think these are seeing the light of day, by the way, since last year. So y'all are getting the behind the scenes look at this. The ugliness, the realness. Um, I love strip plots. I wanted to use them. Um, I think what they do is they give you, like they use minimal space. They're very good at showing the correlations. Um, for multi, multiple vari variables, right? So the colors, again, indicate green for healthy, yellow for unhealthy. And you see based off of these variables where the healthy and unhealthy lie on the spectrum. The challenge was um, trying to build this, get it all in the dashboard in 20 minutes. And whether or not they, they really added significant value to the story I was trying to tell. Um, because what, what ultimately um, 
is what you ultimately see here is that all, all these are different worksheets, right? So you have these strip plots as a single sheet. The variables that are very hard to see um, are also single sheets. So trying to get these all built onto a canvas to show a comprehensive story, um, I found out in my practice was very, very challenging. It's in a 20 minute time frame. Um, so that was iteration number two. So that was Tuesday. And this is all, um, these things I'm, I'm discussing now are all conversations that I was running by Sasha. So trying to get feedback, trying to get another pair of eyes on it as I was practicing um, was really helping me refine the tool and the dashboard. So Wednesday, uh, the main addition here was you have the, the, like, the comprehensive nature of the story is taking shape. Um, I like Nancy Duarte in her book, Data Story. I think she presents a, a data story or a data narrative as having three, three components. So there's a situation, there's a complication, and there's a resolution. And so I wanted to build that in here, and I started to do that in this version where you have this third component of, uh, of resolution, of this is going to show how things get improved. Um, the, the challenge was, or the failure, I think, of, of this particular view, a couple things. Um, this scatter plot, although it was connected from a data standpoint, the coloring was sort of disjointed, where you have all of the global averages in the cities and the observations here in blue. You have the single city that's selected, shown here in red, but they don't tie back to the coloring of these observations on the map. So there's a little bit of confusion there. And I think in terms of the power of Tableau is really allowing for interactivity in the flow of analysis. So I have this parameter up here that drives the interaction um, of, of a, a city selection and updates the bars and the strip plot and the label on the scatter plot. But really, and I'm not sure if this is in this version, maybe. No, it's not. So, so yeah, it is. So really what I wanted to do is allow users to click on an observation um, after looking at the map and then um, have that drive the dashboard update and not this parameter that's sitting up here, maybe even removing this parameter altogether. So again, driving interactivity within the flow of analysis, having the map, having the <laughs> Sorry, that's my office mate. Um, having a user come to the map and then uh, interact with it that way. Okay, so let me go to the next one. Okay, let's go to September 17th here, moving right along. So I think part of the challenge with this also, with these, um, I have somebody at the door. Gosh, we're getting real time, real life Zoom. One second. Yeah, I'm on the Zoom. Yeah, basically. <laughs> uh, sorry, guys. Birthday drop off for my kids from a neighbor. Um, yeah, so trying to make ensure these were more visible if I was going to keep them. So moving away from the dark blue to more of a light gray color um, was a step in the right direction, but still I was gonna run into just the time constraint of trying to get all of this on a dashboard within time. Um, I added the motion here, which I think was a step in the right direction. And I think, I think you see some of the, the history using the pages shelf to show where these observations came from and how they're changing based off of percentage changes in GDP. So I think that was cool. But again, the colors here, I think should ultimately be tied back to the observations in the map to sort of unify the entire analysis and the presentation. Uh, we're getting close to the final build. Lots of failure, lots of iteration. Um, I like the idea of sort of like a, uh, just a, a separator underneath the title. Obviously this is, uh, this is not something that you'd wanna end with because it's all off kilter and off base. Um, having just a basic legend, um, obviously a good thing, but I, this whole thing I felt was, was way too cluttered. Um, and, and even 
as these labels were changed from the strip bars to the circles to like the sort of flags with the numbers, um, I felt like including these variables not only were, was difficult from a time domain perspective, but also they just didn't, they almost detracted uh, and were a distraction from the main story, um, which was nominal GDP, uh, air pollution. So you have things that were interesting, population factored into it, congestion levels, um, and those were certainly factors, but the correlation in my mind was never strong enough, wasn't strong enough to warrant keeping these in the final viz. And I just decided to just focus on the main thing, which was the relationship between the nominal GDP and uh, PM25. So ultimately, after several stressful days, I guess we're not there yet, there's one more version. Oh, this is still close enough. Um, and again, even, even this one, it goes back to trying to keep the main thing the main thing, because you have this little anecdote in the story, which is my hometown, Tucson. It's, it's green, very healthy air, very low. And trying to tie that in somehow to the story would be interesting. It would be cool because it was where I live. But was it the main story that I was trying to tell with the data? Prob probably not. So uh, in the final viz, because I determined that these were ancillary, not primary to the main analysis, these were removed. And I just kept the, the scatter plot. And ultimately, going from failure to failure to failure, I eventually, I feel like, got obviously to a point where I was happy with the final viz. And it was a viz that was um, worthy of winning. So, so yeah, um, the final viz just was very simple, had the scatter plot with the relationship. Um, I added these. Uh, these reference lines just to, to highlight the numbers associated with the selected city. The interactivity in the flow of analysis was there. So the, the parameter action to, to click on a city filter, um, the ability to select city and population and show the discrepancy between population uh, was intact. And then the ability to show the changes uh, from GDP and how it impacts PM25, I thought was good. So um, yeah, so hopefully that was a good behind the scenes look of all of the little steps that got ultimately cut from the final view to lead up to an end product that um, I think I could say nailed it. I mean, my, my opinion, but- uh, I think you nailed it. I think this is fantastic. And what I like about this is not only, I like that you, you drove home a data story and it, not only was it just um, a story somebody could look at, but it was explore like a choose your own adventure exploratory story. Yeah, fantastic. Hey, I have a baton too, so I'm gonna oh. pass this to you. I'm just gonna pretend it's actually oh, wow. It's actually That's an great. attachment from the Dyson vacuum cleaner that's in our house, but let's pretend it's a baton. There I'm you glad go. it's on a plunger. Okay, because <laughs> that's what it looked like. <laughs> so right. I'm going to. Um, share my screen here. Let's make sure I have the right thing. So um, nailed it. You did a great job. And um, along the, I'm, I've kind of brought in a lot of the concepts that all of everybody else has. And it's going to start with a Nelson's um, waiting to the last minute thing, because I, uh, when we started, I had one slide and I have a couple. Um, I'm Anna and I am um, one of the Atlanta Tableau user group leaders. I am, um, and I've, I've just really been lucky to work with this group. Um, my background is, was originally marketing um, with some, actually lots of econ at the University of Georgia, but then I decided not to stay in double major because I was like, I have to write a paper for econ. That doesn't make any sense. I didn't want to write papers. But then later on, I went back to be a back to school to be a teacher. So lots of papers and um, actually like writing now and taught AP statistics and math for a, a long time. And now I'm the director of training, which is data literacy, data storytelling, um, Tableau in, in, in statistics. So um, those are the things. I, um, I live in Woodstock and I was pointing out on chat, uh, there's a lot of conversation about there being this 
maybe a relationship, because I'm not going to say as a, <laughs> it, it's what determines you to, to be a, a, a tug leader, but this relationship between number of kids and that ability to be a tug leader, I would say um, correlation is not causation. And so I will also show in mathematical proofs, of course, if you have one counterexample, then I've disproved it. And so I have two kids, I have two boys, but these two are like having six kids. So QED uh, disproved that theory. I also wanna go along and tag along with that idea of, and just bring it all together. We are facing those challenges and you know, anytime you've brought up as a Tableau workbook or, or really just any, in a situation where you are um, struggling through something and, and you've got to step back and realize the time that you've struggled through something through mistakes and you've persevered and you've gone through that challenge are the times that you've grown the most. And you can probably look at that in any part of your life. So it's not just Tableau or business or professionally, it's it's in every aspect of your life. So I, I really do like the concept of, you know, you double down on those mistakes. You don't just walk away and give up. So um, I think we all here know that, but that that has really become that theme for today. Now I'm over here breaking dashboards. So I'm going to show you a little bit about what I'm going to talk about. And because I work with a lot of um, more novice users um, when I'm instructing, and I'm also working with um, a lot of newbie consultants, I get a lot of, hey, and I broke the dashboard. And I'm most, a lot of the time, my, the, the situation that's in, because I've been in this situation. So the situation is where they have um, just completely disregarded Tableau's order of operations for filters. And, and those order of operations, as you can see here, they also apply to calculations. So as we go through this, the, um, Oops, sorry, I went too far there. As we go through this, I like to show you um, just a little bit about how some of those order of operations apply. All right, so I built this. This is not a real dashboard, um, but it's one I built in Tableau. Uh, and then I came back and broke it and then created this table you'll see here at the bottom to, to verify numbers. So verification of numbers, of course, important as well. So I'm going to start at the top here. And at the top, um, I have. At the very top here on the left, I have some filters applied. So let me go back and if I hit all on the filters here for the region, you'll see that it kind of looks like things are working on the top shelf. So it's on the top chart, excuse me. So looking at this bar graph, I have created a top end filter. This is the top 10 most profitable products. And if you count them, it looks like there could be 10, looks right. All right, good. Well, let's say I want to like, drill down into the region. So by region, I'd like to see those profitable products. And by the way, the color here represents, if you see at the top, um, how are we shipping this, that ship mode? So express air, standard, and ground. So we're looking more at the logistics of these products. So if I drill down into the central region, now I'm starting to look one, two, three, four, five, six. And how is it that if I'm looking at the top 10, I only have six? And it would be easy to ignore that and just look at the overall dashboard. But if you're not looking at these little issues here, you're gonna real, you're not gonna realize you have a problem. So going back to the order of operations here in Tableau, come down to where it says dimension filter. So a dimension filter is when you put a dimension onto filter and then you just quick filter, right? But you can adjust a dimension filter to be a different kind of filter. And when I did the top 10, I created what's called over here a top end filter. And a top end filter executes before the dimension filter in that order of operations. So what I have to do is somehow change the order. So if you think about math class, because remember, math teacher here, order of operations that you remember from class was please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. And then of course, around the interwebs, they always have those little math problems floating around of like, do you know the answer of this? And you know, someone forgot to put parentheses somewhere or you have to remember left to right how to do the calculations for the order of operations. 
Um, and, and then if you have, let's say, if you need to execute addition before division, one of the things we do in math is put parentheses around the addition. So that actually moves addition up in the order of operations. Um, I like to think of um, context filters as a way to put parentheses around that calculation or that, in this case, the filter. So what I'm gonna do first here is show you how I can fix this problem with my top end filter so that they execute in the correct way. In um, the first thing you have to think about here though is, is first, okay, wrap your mind around what is it doing? So I'm gonna click on this. I like to always, when I, when I teach this, I tell people, okay, what is Tableau doing? Like stop and think. And what it's doing here is calculating the top 10 most profitable products overall for the entire data set. Um, and then it's coming along and calculating and, and considering, okay, taking that top 10, of that top 10, who's in the central region? or what's in the central region. So that's that's what's going on. So if we look here where I have product name on filter, this is my top end filter. And so it's in top 10 and that's executing first. But if I wanna move it in the order of operations, I can't just change the order on the filter shelf. It doesn't let us do that. Instead, I have to take my dimension filter, put parentheses around it, and that's adding it to context. So a context filter allows that filter to operate independent of the dimension filter. So in the drop down menu on that pill, we're just going to add to context. And now we have our 10 back. So if I go back to my chart or my dashboard, here we go. I don't know what that is on there. Then I can see that this is now working properly. So that was the first example. Now I am actually going to go back to the sheet and take it off context because I broke another part. And I wanted to show you that as well. So I'm going to remove from context and come down here on the left. I have over here, I like to create some dynamic insights. So what you can see some summaries, some summaries of like what's going on over here on the left and then um, be able to see the visualization over there on the right. And what you can see here is I now have this insight here, prior year shipping costs and this breakdown by segment. Um, below that, or down here, I created also some tables. This is the first table to help us just verify those numbers. That way we're not switching back and forth between charts. I wouldn't actually have this on a dashboard. I just did this for you guys to show you that in 2020, by the way, this is prior year shipping costs. That'd be 2020. So in 2020 for the central region, I just highlighted that because that's the, where we filtered then what are those values for shipping costs? And those numbers do not align to what we see here. So I'm gonna go back to this chart now and see well, why. The calculation I've created here is a, a fixed level of detail calculation. So I'm gonna do, this is the, um, filter it here because I can't find anything. Prior year shipping costs, and this is a fixed level of detail calculation. And um, nothing wrong with the calculation. It's not calculating incorrectly. I have it correct, except that I have a filter. So the next thing I get asked is, okay, when it's broken is, you know, something's disappearing or the numbers aren't right. And then the next question I have is, do you, are you using a fixed level of detail calculation? Yes. Are you using a dimension filter? Yes. Well, that level of detail calculation is executing first and then filtering, and it's not the correct order. And again, order of operations, we have the fixed LOD executing before dimension. So if we wanna switch the two, again, we can use a context filter, putting parentheses around that dimension filter. So here I'm gonna do that again, oops, get back to the sheet, and change my filter to context. All right, that'll work. And now both the top chart with the bars and my insights are working. Okay, good to go. One last thing. Now I'm going to drill down into this data and I wanna be able to see the breakdown. So you'll see down here below a cost breakdown by delivery method. So if I click on, for example, consumer, I wanna see that breakdown, oh, there we go. 
consumer, there we go, that cost breakdown by that one segment. Well, it's kind of odd to me that all three are the same. And since the, all three are the same, I'm going to go sniff test this. Um, what I did is actually created a table to check this. The table actually has all those values in it. And this shows me that the central region numbers should look like this, not these. So I'm going to look at what the problem is. For once again, this calculation, the prior year shipping, this is a fixed, and I can show you this. This is my fixed LOD. Actually, I'll just open it up for you. And my fixed LOD, it executes before a dimension filter. Oh, what's the dimension filter? I should have mentioned that that action. So that drill down action, when I clicked on it, the filter action in Tableau executes at the same time as a dimension filter. So it acts like a dimension filter every single time. So I clicked on that, that drill down was a dimension filter. Well, okay, so why don't you just put, Anna, let's put the action onto contacts, just like we did. Okay, y'all watch these numbers. They're not gonna change. And that's because region is already on contacts. And I needed region on contacts for the other two charts to work. So now what do I do when I can't use contacts to fix the order of operations? Well, in this example, and I'm going to go back to the order of operations, this example, I could also change the LOD. Notice an include or exclude LOD executes after dimensions. In this situation, I'm going to, again, go back to this sheet, and I've created a calculation using include. So it, for this one, include will work the same as as fixed. And by the way, a lot of folks have said, oh, why do I need include when fixed uses most, uh, fix will work for most of those include situations, but that's actually not true. Include's useful. And this is one of those situations where I need include. So I'm going to switch that number here and switch it here. And now those numbers, let's, let's hope I do work. No, it's not wanting to show up because, you know, that's what's going to happen. I don't know what it just did, but um, those numbers should work. And Hide your title. What I do? Hide your title. Everything else is fine. Why did the title show up? No, no. Just I don't know something, but just hide it. Okay. Oh, the title was there already. It just oh this I know the access the access came back. That's what it was because I switched the pills. Ah, there you go. So, okay. So now it's not. Oh, I got to fix it on here. Okay, so it worked earlier and now it's, why does that happen? <laughs> so um, there is a situation that I had and now I can't figure out what it is. The, of course it worked on for me and then it, now it doesn't work for the drill down here and why is it not? Somebody help me out here, what I do wrong? Oh, taking this, maybe I'll, no, that didn't work. <laughs> Well, it worked earlier. <laughs> so now that is a great demonstration of how you can nail it and then get it incorrect because these numbers aren't matching. So watch me turn red. Um, Anna, do you need to do the same? You, you switched out the metric on one. Oh, out, well, you know. this is the same metric. So this is, um, well, this is a ship. Is it shipping with include or is it shipping with fixed? It's just regular shipping. So it's not using an LOD. Gotcha. So yeah, this one's just verifying it. Why is it that I worked earlier? Okay, so I'm going to go figure this out. <laughs> why it didn't work earlier. And I'm going to post this later if anyone wants to play with it. But there is a problem now that, hey, great teaching moment of how you, your order of operations can break it in with this... Um, Self-service analytics, we have this ability to go, okay, well, it's right. And we walk away from it. And then we are not verifying those numbers and we're not checking. So, oh, I know what it is. This is for small business only. And I didn't change this to, um, it's, it doesn't matter if that one's on context. I'm not looking just small business. It didn't, here we go. I've got a, um, I know what it was. My dashboard action needs to change this chart as well because it's drilling down to, um, and I think I took it off the action. So my apologies, but I figured it out now. This is- Nailed it. I nailed it. See, thank nailed you. It. 
That was well played. Um, let's see, what did I call that now? I do this drill down insights. Time to ship. No. I should have. Um, cost insights, maybe. I don't know. Hold on. What did I call this? Um, I'll fix that really quickly while y'all are watching so you can see. Um, we call that cost insights table. There we go. So that was the problem. And by the way, let me let me to verify what someone just said that we it's not that one. Sorry. Cost insights table. I have them hiding. I'm not sure what just happened here. So here we go. Let's see if that works. Dashboard actions and edit. Yeah, something just like <laughs> broke again. So let me fix that. It went to changing insights, which is the wrong one, and it needs to change cost insights table. There we go. There are the numbers. <laughs> yeah, that action got like jumped around when I. And I, I will go back and fix that later. So going back to this one now, somebody asked like if it should be on context and it, and the action and well, now the action is gone. I don't know why. There we go. So now the action should be applied. And then if you put that on context, it doesn't change it because the context didn't matter because now they're both on context. They're not, they're not applying it correctly, which is why I had to change. So in, conclusion, that particular chart, I had to change it to an include LOD because, and that works now, and that's because that executes after dimension filters, and I could not move in after context, and I couldn't move those filters. So thanks for playing with me, and actually, I, I, just to, to what I was saying, what you were all saying, like, I am totally cool showing that big, mis the mistake that I'd taken it off of the actions, um, that wasn't intentional, but it shows you that we all make mistakes <laughs> and they, they're, that was a learning moment for all of us. And I'm like sweating under my collar, <laughs> like a learning moment for all of us while we're trying to, um, learn how to work with Tableau and learn from our mistakes.